Well, I met David uh, at uh, Precision Cameras uh, PCU, I don't know how long ago. And uh, then uh, a few years ago, I did his winter workshop in the Tetons, which is another highly recommended trip if you can deal with the cold. <laughs> and met the people at Triangle X Ranch, which just a wonderful group of people and a almost family to anybody that stays with them for a while. And then I've also done his Iceland workshop this year. And as you may have guessed, David has been around in photography for quite a while. He's a Tamron master has been teaching, I think for 20 years now, 30 almost. Oh, wow. Mm. I know it don't look that old, but you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I say that when I look in the mirror too. <laughs> <laughs> I need new prescriptions on the glasses, obviously. <laughs> but just an all around get great guy and has to be even better because he, he's married to an Evelyn. <laughs> <laughs> so David, if you'd like to take over and go where you want to go here. Sure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen here. Let's let's go there. And then we've got to click on that. There we go. I'm going to pause that. Um, so thank you guys for having me. Um, you know, I, it's, it's Zoom has been an interesting introduction to my photography career. I, I, I'm not a big computer fan. I never was. But I tell you, Zoom has helped me keep my sanity over the past two years for sure. Um, we've started doing some live workshops again, which is good. Um, and, you know, I always enjoy that, but, you know, I, I look forward to the day that, that we do fewer Zooms and we're doing more and more, you know, in-person meetings. Um, just to give you a little, a little history of, of, you know, where I come from with photography. Um, growing up and all the way through high school and into college, I was actually an illustrator or a painter. And um, I found that uh, my, my father put a camera in my hand in 1972, and I found that I started enjoying the creation aspect with the camera more so than I did the paintbrush. Um, I, I, not that I had a short attention span, but I had a short attention span and I really just enjoyed photographing scenes. Sometimes I would go back and paint them very rarely. Now do I ever pick up a paintbrush? Um, <coughs> and I'll, I'll apologize now for coughing continually during this. I told some of the group, I came down with a summer cold, um, but I started uh, working as a full-time professional in 1992 when I got out of the Marine Corps, and I was doing primarily portrait photography. And I really almost felt like it was, excuse me, <coughs> almost felt like it was sort of taking away my joy and my pleasure of photography because I love photographing the outdoors. I love photographing people, but not in the same scale that I did um, photographing landscapes and macro um, and wildlife for that matter. <clears throat> so I gave myself a Christmas present one year and, and took a trip up to the Great Smoky Mountains for a workshop with uh, a group called the Great American Photography Weekends with uh, Bill Fortney and the speaker that weekend was John Shaw. And at the end of the weekend, they, uh, they asked me if I would like to join them as one of their instructors. And I had to jump on the opportunity because it the pay wasn't really great if you looked at just the financial aspect of it, but I would be traveling every week and months on end with John Shaw and Art Wolf and Galen Rowell and Brian Peterson. So I felt it was an opportunity for an education that was going to be, you know, really everything that I was looking for. And I did that for a few years before I broke off on my own. And then in 1999, I, I stood before my classes here in Atlanta. I, I live in North Georgia. But in, in Atlanta, and I, I looked at the group and I said, uh, do not fall into this digital photography craze, for it is nothing more than a passing fancy. And, you know, I, I really regretted that statement for a couple of years. But in 2002, I picked up my first digital camera, which was an Olympus. And, you know, now I look at, at going back and I would never go back to film. Um, digital photography for me is, is a much better medium and tool for expressing my artistic expression when I'm trying to 
capture something in photography. I do everything. I do landscapes. I do macro. Um, I really got into macro heavy when I first got into photography and or nature photography because I just didn't have a budget to travel. But there was always things in the garden to photograph. And I found that simply photographing tiny things made me better to photograph big things. So tonight, though, we're going to talk about landscape photography. And uh, like Bill said, I, I am one of the Tamron Image Masters. Um, you know, they just, uh, it's, I've been one of their working professionals now for about, oh gosh, 16 years, I guess, 17 years. And they've got uh, professionals that are image masters and they have ambassadors, which my teaching partner Cecil Holmes is, and then Lisa Langell is an ambassador as well. Um, but they, they do a lot of sponsorship for our events that we go to and things like this that uh, make, it, make it so we're able to continue, you know, doing our career while we do these, these lectures. So what makes a landscape image successful? And I, I always start with this because there's two aspects to it. First and foremost, when you as a photographer enjoy what you photograph and what you've captured, um, I, I always, I mean, and like I said, having been a teacher for a very long time now, I find that people tend to be their worst enemies. Now, you should always be your worst critic but at the same time, you should never be your worst enemy that you should not start comparing yourself to other photographers because you're always going to be at different points of, of your, your visual interpretation of things. And it's not fair to compare yourself to other photographers. Always, if you're going to do that, you should compare yourself to the photographer you were a year ago, two years ago. But beyond that, something that makes the landscape image successful is simply getting the viewer's attention and controlling their attention as they view the, the image. So um, we look at a lot of the rules of composition when we do this. We look at leading lines. We look at um, the rule of thirds, and we're going to discuss all those. But we also look at breaking those because there's, there's no set rule for photography every single time there's they should be more of instead of rules they should be guidances and you should be able to to break them as often as possible so the idea for me is i'm going to try to move this little bar out of the bottom of my screen i don't know if you guys can see that in yours let's see there we go um the idea for me in an image like this is to have the viewer put themselves in this place they want to be at the Miller House, which is that little house at, at the base of the Tetons in mm -hmm. uh, the Elk Refuge, National Elk Refuge. Um, I, I want you to feel, you know, inside what it would be like to live in this house. And I think that's when I've, I'm successful with an image. When I evoke an emotion or for some people, a memory, they may not have been there for years and they see this and they go, oh my gosh, you know, I remember this from years and years ago. Um, one thing that you'll find is, even, even though I do try to follow the rule of thirds, I'm more of a rule of eight tenths kind of guy or nine tenths kind of guy. And you'll see that as we go through a lot of the images. Let me click here. There we go. So let me talk a second about the gear that I use. Um, camera lens, tripod releases and filters. Um, I look at, at one of my favorite types, and, and I know that probably a lot of you are familiar with David Munch and, and his days at Arizona Highways Magazine. Um, to me, he's the, the epitome of the wide angle, you know, ultra wide angle landscape photographer. And, you know, in doing wide angle, it's a lot of it is, is simply taking an element and placing it in the foreground to distort the, the view of what you see. So it can be something very, very small. And you're using that ultra wide angle lens to capture the viewer's attention and then lead you through the frame. Um, you know, I am on the, 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 the slide previous, uh, you know, camera and lenses, of course, digital. Um, I use a tripod for about 95% of all the um, landscape work that I do. I try to use releases simply taking my hand off the camera. Um, and I do use circular polarizers primarily, <coughs> excuse me. And I do use some of the graduated neutral density filters, but I think that with a lot of the advances that are in Lightroom and Photoshop, the need for some of these tools is getting less and less. Um, I haven't had a chance to play with some of the newer tools that, that they just released in Lightroom, but I'm, I'm really impressed with if, if they do what I'm reading, they do. And I think it's going to be really, really interesting to see how well they work. So 
asymmetrical compositions, if you're not familiar with that term, there's two types of compositions. There's symmetrical, which tends to be centered left to right, top to bottom, often referred to as bullseye. Everything is balanced. Um, I prefer asymmetrical compositions, which I'm actually going to create a visual imbalance and cause the viewer to look at something and visually get uncomfortable almost. And by doing that, I have to balance it out with other elements within the frame. And we'll talk about that. This is in the Teton several years ago. So if you look at the uh, arrow leaf balsam root in the foreground, again, these things are about 18 inches tall. And I've got a very wide angle lens jammed down into them. And immediately it grabs your attention. And as you study the frame, you work your way back eventually to the Tetons, you know, with some beautiful morning light hitting them uh, with some clouds and the storm coming through. Uh, one thing that's very, very important is if you're going to grab the viewer's attention, you need to make sure you give them a path, even if it's a narrow path, to work their way through physically and visually as you're doing something with these images. Um, you don't want to take them to a fence post all the time and, and have them stop, um, because visually, if a, if a fence is there, you know, they don't feel they can go beyond that point. So just uh, be careful of that. Sometimes it's, it's no way around it, but when you can do that, you, you should try. Uh, this is Vesterhorn in, in Iceland. This is getting onto the, the beach, getting a uh, very wide angle lens, in this case, a 17 millimeter jammed into the black sand with the grass on the foreground, and then just simply using it to distort and repeat the patterns of the foreground into the mountain in the background. So again, just a, an ultra wide angle lens dis distorts that perspective of the foreground and the background. This is in Sertamont in Acadia National Park in Maine. And again, attention to detail is something that I can't urge enough that you can see I've, I've elevated my tripod high enough that there's no merger between this fern and the ferns that are behind it. So I'm allowing that perspective to go ahead and give me that separation. And then visually you can go either way around it and then work your way back into the frame and through the birch and, and into the ferns behind it. Uh, you'll come out covered in ticks, but at the same time, you can do that if you choose. Uh, it's, it's intended visually and, and literally that if you did want to walk, you could. So landscapes with a standard lens. So a standard lens is what's roughly thought of as about 50 millimeters. Um, I tend to look of it as anything 35 millimeters to about 70 millimeters, I consider standard lens. Uh, anything wider than 35 is, is uh, wide or ultra wide. Anything longer than 70 starts to be a telephoto lens. Uh, this is down in Apalachicola, Florida. This was after Hurricane Matthew came through and did a lot of destruction. Um, we found this flag. Someone had, had sort of uh, propped it up in this, uh, this little pylon that was there. And we thought it was really neat. We didn't, didn't mess with it. We just went down early in the morning and photographed it with beautiful lights and colors. Uh, just at a little bit slower shutter speed to give it some of the movement. Um, with this particular one as well, I wanted to make sure that I left some space above the top of the pylon. Again, this is attention to detail. I didn't mind these being cut off, but I wanted that area above the main one to have some space. So I'm giving my viewer some room to go around and maneuver around that. It wasn't going to stop them at that point. Uh, this is in two mile uh, on Apalachicola as well. This is just a sunrise shot of a shrimp boat. Um, you know, the state of Florida, I'm a little concerned about them. They decided that they were going to spend $30 million and clean up all the old boats on, on the, the coastline. And this is one of the boats that they removed. They most recently removed the uh, Donna Kay out of Cape Sandblast. And, you know, it was, it's, they've always been these great subject matters for the photographers. Um, and that's why a lot of people went to these areas because of the images that they saw. But, you know, they sort of took that away when they, they went in and, and hauled all the old boats out of the water. Uh, Delicate Arch. This is with a 70 millimeter lens, just back a little bit on the, on the backside of the bowl, photographing over with LaSalle Mountains in the background. So landscapes with a telephoto lens. Uh, this is down in St. George Island, simply using that app Photo Pills to determine when the best time to photograph the full moon, uh, lining it up with the St. George Lighthouse. And this is with a 150 to 600 millimeter lens at 600 millimeters. And I just simply weighed it and had to move a couple times to, to line it up perfectly. 
but the exposure was for the moon and I just brought the shadows and stuff up. I didn't do a, a multiple exposure on it, just a single exposure. This is in Resurrection Bay. It's called uh, Spire Cove. And this is with the 150 to 500 millimeter lens. And at this, with this, I actually shot it at about F11. Um, typically with a, a long focal length lens on landscapes, I'm going to try to open it up wider than F8. Um, I'm wanting to isolate a little bit, but in this case, I want it, the repetition of those spires, how they, they were, uh, you know, repeated behind them with the, the big trees. And so I thought it would be nice to have those a little bit more in focus than normal. So this is shooting out of a boat with uh, the 150 to 500. It's probably F11, F16, somewhere in that area. So a lot of the, a lot of times, you know, photographers give these all-in-one lenses a bad rap. You know, I love having all-in-one lenses. Um, currently, the 28 to 200 is my favorite for my Sony system. The full frames, 18 to 300 is my favorite for the crop sensors. But they allow you in situations like this when you're hoping for one thing, but it doesn't happen, something else happens for you. So this is an Oxbow Ben one spring, and you can see the color that's in the upper right. I was hoping to get a beautiful reflection of this light in the, in the, in the Oxbow there. Just, it didn't work. It, the wind picked up, uh, the reflection disappeared, but some light hit the peaks in the background. And this was with a 16 to 300 millimeter lens, simply zooming into the 300 millimeters. I was able to go into the Grand itself and capture that beautiful light that's hitting the backside of the Grand. So again, that first image, and then zooming in. This is uh, another image uh, on the Oregon coast. This is with the uh, 18 to 400. And I was simply uh, focused and trying to get both the lighthouse and the little bed and breakfast that's off to the right there, the light, lighthouse. Um, B and B as they call it over there. And then I simply zoomed in to 400 millimeters to capture just the lighthouse. This is down in Ossabaw Island. Um, this was just a, the sun rising, um, just in that sea haze that's there. And then simply zooming in, this is with the 28 to 200. Um, this was at 28 millimeters, then at 200 millimeters, simply getting that, that sun rising up over the horizon. So the all-in-ones really can be something that's extremely beneficial and extremely helpful because a lot of times you, you guys know that, I mean, light doesn't last that long, that you could be out there and you may only have minutes or, or seconds at that matter, you know, to make that change. And that's not going to give you the time to change lenses and make any, uh, you know, adaptations to it that you need. So having that all-in-one zoom is really beneficial. So let's talk for a minute about elements and leading lines. Um, elements are, when I was an illustrator, elements were just simply something that I would paint into a spot on the canvas. Um, it was easy as an illustrator because I could put it anywhere I wanted to. I didn't have to worry about the reality of where it really was. Um, as a photographer, I'm having to rely more on the angle of view, the, the lens that I'm selecting, finding the element, then finding other elements within the frame, and then leading the viewer through the frame, like I talked about in the, in the initial uh, slide. So I can do that through S curves. I can do it through leading lines. I can just simply do it through repetition as well. Uh, this is one of the barns, uh, John, um, John mm -hmm. Moulton's barn on uh, Mormon Row in, in the Tetons. And I'm simply using that, that big fence post in the foreground to capture the viewer's attention. And then the natural uh, rails that go off to the right sort of leads you over. You can almost walk your way through the snow over here into the door that's on the side there. Um, anyone that's been to this piece in Cades Cove, you know this place. This is Sparks Lane. And I love photographing dirt roads and paved roads, any type, because as a photographer, my goal is often to try to have the person viewing the image think or dream or wonder. And in this case, with the fog down the road, you naturally wonder what's down there. And I try to invite the viewer through imagination to wander down that road, to go down there and see what's there. 
So I love photographing roads, especially foggy roads, because again, it's, 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 you know, what's behind you, but you don't always know what's in front of you. And I think part of the thrill of life is, is wandering down that road to find out what lies ahead. So that's one of those things that's sort of fun to do. Uh, White Sands National Monument. I think it's a national monument. So I don't know if it's national park yet. Um, it's a monument. It's a monument still. Okay. I thought it was, but I couldn't remember. Um, I love getting out there with a, a wide angle lens and just getting down into the sand. Um, you know, one thing that I always caution anybody that's gone out to photograph out there, make sure you're paying attention to where you came from, where you're going to, because that is one of the easiest places to get uh, lost, or as we men call it, geographically displaced. Um, <laughs> I, I have, I have, I have been one of those people that that wandered around for thirty minutes, forty-five minutes, till you know I found the path again. Um, but I just love going out there because there's so many lines, and you have to get away from all the footprints. So you've got to wander out there a little bit. But just like I said, be careful. Make sure you 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 look behind you. A lot of times, one thing that I do and and people think it's odd, but when they think about it, it makes sense. As I'm walking out to a place, I'll stop and I'll do a 180 degree turn and I'll photograph behind me. And the reason that I do that is because when I'm making my return trip, that's what's going to look familiar to me, not what's in front of me. So, or was in front of me as I hiked out. So by stopping every hundred, 200 yards, whatever the case may be, you know, photograph the trail, photograph, you know, the horizon line, photograph the the, the points of interest that, that can help you line up where you're going to. Um, obviously, if you've got a car that's got a GPS on it that you can simply find your way back, that's easy. But, you know, it's just good to do that, that if you're out hiking on unfamiliar trails, you know, take pictures. Uh, this is the Jessup Trail in Acadia National Park, again, in Suramont. And what I simply did in this is I didn't have the fog, so I just took a little radial filter and I did a little bit of Gaussian blur for the very center and then lightened it up a little bit because, again, I want that mystery. I want that mystique of what lies ahead on the trail. <coughs> Excuse me. So I just love doing that. Uh, this is an area of North Georgia here, just about 30 minutes from my house called Dix Creek. And I just love the way that I almost had the repetition of the log going this way with the shoreline and then the water going over to the other shoreline, leading me up to the falls up at the very top. Um, I just look for things like that. Um, I love photographing water very slow. A lot of people don't like that, but slowing it down to me gives it a consistency and a solid line. And those solid lines become my leading lines very often. And that's what I'm looking for. Um, I want to control that viewer's attention. And this is just one of those ways that I do it. I could have gotten in and removed this log, but you know, I'm just one of those people. Sometimes I'm a, I'm a purist because I look at, you know, something could be living under that log and I don't want to destroy its home. So sometimes I'll leave it. Uh, this is in a place called Secret Canyon. And I'm not saying that I won't tell you where it's at. It's not really a secret. That's actually the name of it is Secret Canyon. And I have photographed in the Antelope Canyons just many, 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 many times. But I found now that they just get so crowded that as a photographer, if you want to go in and take your time, um, they rush you through in the Antelope Canyon. So, I mean, you, you pay extra for a photography tour. They let you set up for about 30 seconds, maybe a minute or so, and then they're pushing you along. Um, the Secret Canyon that we went to cost about 135, 150 bucks, but that was for four hours and we had the canyon to ourselves. There was literally five of us in the canyon and it was just so nice being able to move through, not worry about you know, dodging people or trying to get people out of your frame, waiting for them to get out. You had the, the, the roam of the entire canyon and you just simply can find those different canyons, secret canyons, one of them. Um, I'm trying to think of names of a couple others, but you can just uh, go into some of the, in Google, uh, the, the uh, area around Page, Arizona, and they can, they can tell you where they're at or the services to get out there. Now, this is Tybee Island down on the Georgia coast. And what I'm using here is this is this nice foreground element. This log is only about, gosh, I'd, I'd venture to say 18 inches long. And I'm just simply using a slow exposure and allowing the air bubbles and the surf to go around it 
to create that interest in the foreground. And then as you start to wander following those bubbles through the water, you find the tree and everything in the tree takes you eventually to where the sun is rising. So all of these are, are very, very intentional um, when I'm arranging visually for these, these different elements. And, you know, that's, that's one big thing that I teach is, is I don't sweat the exposure very often. Um, digital cameras are very forgiving, number one, um, but they do a, a really good job of capturing the dynamic range. Uh, but the composition is really what, you, what do you, you want to make sure you're getting right with each image and very, very intentional when I'm doing these things. Uh, my wife and I volunteer primarily she does I help out at an equine therapy center and yes I am laying in horse poop but that was the only way to get this double rainbow above the horses that were out there this that evening um, just an incredible scene not very very much nature just a, a different landscape but these uh, the name of this place is angels on horseback so I thought it was very appropriate to have a double rainbow above the horses so a place near me is called Gibbs Garden, and I love photographing there because the, the person who designed it is an artist in, in his own. He does everything intentionally. Everything, there's no straight lines that are there. Everything is a curved line. It's, it's very much artistic. So, you know, visiting with him and just walking and talking, you just find so many neat things excuse me so many neat things in there to photograph and this is just a maintenance road going up through some yoshino cherry trees and um i just i just found it really interesting and photographed it and this is during COVID. i used to spend a day there just wandering and looking at everything because it was so a lack of people there so there's been studies as to how we see things and you know i heard kodak did it and i've heard other people have done it um, somebody said they did this study uh, and I sort of liked the way that it, it, it was based. So I repeat it often. I don't know who to give proper credit to though. Um, they said that here in the Western culture, we read left to right, top to bottom. So when we look at placing things in those PowerPoints or at places in our frames, upper thirds, lower thirds, left thirds, right thirds, center thirds, supposedly the strongest one for us would be the bottom right because if we're starting at the top on the left we're going to eventually visually end on the bottom right just like we're reading on a page so i often will, will experiment where i photograph on the bottom left then i'll photograph in the center and then i'll photograph on the bottom right now granted there are some other elements in the in the image as well to the left but i do think that just even the shape of the tree lends the viewer to go ahead and and I think that this is the most settling composition is when it's in the lower right and, you know, get your guys opinion on this at some point. Um, but I just, I just find that it tends to work for me. Now I don't know, you know, in the, in the um, Asian culture, if they read, I mean, they read right to left. So I'm sort of curious to see if it's a different perspective, if you're raised in a different culture than what we are here in the Western culture. Um, another set of images that I'm, I'm looking at, um, <clears throat> if you're going to give someone a leading line, you've got to make it so it's a clean line. It's got to be unobstructed. This is on Hyatt Lane. And if you look down the road, you can barely see there's a lot of intrusion on this tree that goes over the road and alongside the road. And this is just standing on the right hand side of the road. However, if I move to my left to the center of the road, all of a sudden you really get some nice space in here. You get a nice clean path, but I think that you lack sort of the, the interest in the foreground that you have or that you would need to get you going. So simply moving all the way to the left. Now I have a nice distinct line to follow. I've got a nice road that takes me through. There's no obstruction. The fence posts give repetition, the taller grasses and, and weeds give some repetition there as well. So again, I'll flip through those three. I just personally think that it's strongest all the way to the left. You know, and with digital film, I know that I, I, I differ from a lot of photographers. I believe in, in if they're going to put 2,000 frames on a card, take 2,000 if you feel you need to. 
a lot of people say, oh, you know, you should take one frame. You should set your composition up. You know, I, I, I disagree because so many times what you see in an image and you like it at one point may be totally different than what you look and see and like two hours later or the next day. Um, I always make this comparison between uh, digital film and, and, and therapy that an hour of therapy may cost $150, whereas a, a memory card can be as cheap as 20 bucks, you know, fill that memory card up, then you don't have to spend the 150 bucks on therapy for an hour finding out why you didn't fill that card up. So, you know, take those, we're, we're all learning every single day, every day that I go out, I'm learning something with photography. And the way that I learn is I make mistakes. And when I make mistakes, I find out what I like and what I don't like. So by all means, you know, do everything, bracket, do whatever you got to do. So repetition and negative space. And I know that as a camera club, negative space is one of those dreaded words or terms that, that you don't ever want to hear from the judges. Um, I would get eaten alive by judges and competitions probably because I live in a world of negative space when it comes to simplicity. And I try to really minimize the amount of objects in there because excuse me i'm i'm trying to i'm trying to make it simple for the viewer and the less there is to think about the easier it is for the viewer to follow along with my thought process so i use repetition i use negative space and you'll see in some of these images there's a lot of negative space this is a place in the in grand teton national park not a lot of people know about it not a lot of people go to there um, I've been photographing there since the 90s. This is a place called the Patriarch Tree. It's not marked on any maps. It's about a mile off of the main road or off of the, the main loop road. And, you know, you just have to wander out and find it. Um, I can give you some good directions if you're ever interested in going out. But I like this because for several reasons. I like the repetition of the trees here with the repetitions. This one sort of reminded me of these. These three guys reminded me of these with the little point beside it. But then I also had the same basic repetitive repetition and line here as well. So I really sort of like that. And this is with a little bit longer lens. This is with about a probably a 105 to 135 focal length somewhere in there to go ahead and give me that compression. I am photographing at F11 or F16 to get some focal point there. Even though that long lens is compressing it, I still want to get that 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 focus, you know, to be able to see the repetition there. This one to me was really kind of neat. I looked down and I saw this rock that was almost a repetition, but inverted from the trees that were behind it. This was up in Acadia National Park on Cadillac Mountain in a nice foggy morning. And mornings like that, just they force you to look for things. And that's when I do my best photography, you know, in, in my opinion, um, is because I'm trying to find something. And when I force myself to see things differently, and a lot of times it's, it's taking a lens that I normally wouldn't use in this situation and putting that lens on the camera because I start to see things differently. So, you know, just finding that repetition. This is in uh, uh, Grand Teton National Park on Grovant Kelly Road. And I simply used a square crop here because there was some just stuff over here that I didn't want to clone out. But I liked this tree in the foreground and then the repetition of the tree behind it and the other one giving you a path down this road. Um, I, I really wanted to make sure that I paid attention and gave myself separation between this big tree in the foreground and that tree immediately to the right of it. Because again, I want to make sure those elements are separate. I want them not to merge together. I want them to work together visually to, to get the viewer's attention to go in a certain direction. This is the little yellow house at uh, Holly Country. Um, just beautiful conditions when it's in whiteout. Uh, you can see my reflection in the window, but I just thought this is as minimalistic as you can get almost. I mean, it's a yellow house in snow with whiteout conditions. Um, doesn't get much more simple like that. But to me, that's all that the image needs. Anything else is going to be a distraction. Grand Teton National Park, 150 to 600 millimeter lens finding one tree on a hillside to isolate white out conditions again. This is on St. George Island. I was photographing the earth shadow, which is that blue 
on the horizon right before the sun rises. The sun's going to rise when that reaches the horizon right there at the edge of the blue. Right in the middle of photographing, this guy walked out on the left-hand side over here and started fishing. Um, and then he saw me laying over there and he panicked. He thought that I had drowned. I was laying in a tidal pool and he came running over and I told him I was, I was fine. I was just photographing. And then he came over and he looked and he goes, oh my God, I'm in your frame. I'm sorry. I'll get out of the way. I said, now do me a favor, just stay there. But I said, try to be real still because I'm doing about a 30 second exposure. So he went back and he stood for about 30 seconds and I probably did two or three frames and the guy never moved and I almost felt bad, but I finally yelled to him. Hey, I'm finished and walked over, started talking to him, got his address. And I sent him some of the images, you know, that I did that morning. Whenever I photograph somebody, I do my best to get their information and always send it to them because number one, for me, it's a potential client, but also they're, they're taking their time and letting you photograph them. So even that they're unrecognizable, I'll still go ahead and get that, that name and, and a model release when I can. Cityscapes, I do some cityscapes as well. This is the St. Louis Arch. I was up at Shutterfest a couple of years ago, and this is with a 15 millimeter lens, just trying to capture as much of the arch as I could. The Brooklyn Bridge, and the Manhattan skyline, and then simply going to the other side of the bridge, the, the famous area in the park. Almost got arrested here because I stepped over some grass from one sidewalk to another, and there was a park authority there. And he told me I had to come back over, didn't step on the grass, but I had to come back over, walk all the way down the sidewalk and then do the, the switch back to get back to where I was just by jumping from one side to the other. So anyway, so landscapes or wildlife images. When I'm photographing wildlife, I'll do the typical wildlife image, but I also like to include a lot of the environment because it becomes something that's, that's more for when I'm photographing natural history. It gives a perspective, number one, but it gives a sense of a place that the animal is living. So with this orca pod up in uh, Resurrection Bay, I just really liked how they were all coming up, uh, the blows, then you've got the, the gulls above them, then you've got the shoreline and the trees. So it gives you a sense of place and a sense of, of living area that they're in. <coughs> Excuse me, let me drink a little water. Sorry about that. This is in Lake Clark, um, the bear down here in the foreground. This was, this was done at about 1130, 1145 at night. And this beautiful rim lighting around this big coastal brown bear. Um, just, you know, to me, I could have zoomed in. This is probably with a 50 millimeter lens. I could have zoomed in to 500 millimeters and, and gotten just a nice rim lighting of the bear itself. But you know, I just wanted to include that environment. I think it gives it a sense of place. Oh, let me, oh, nightscapes. Okay. So um, I do like to photograph a lot of the nightscapes, the night skies, um, a couple settings for you, just as a point of reference for starting. Um, I start at 3200 ISO. I have my camera in manual mode and I usually start at 30 seconds. Um, I start at uh, the widest aperture on the lens. So 3,200 ISO, 30 seconds, widest aperture and manual focus. And I look at the, the LCD screen, I zoom in and I move my focus ring in manual focus until the stars tend to get very pinpoint. Um, you'll see it, they, they like the big star that's to the left, I think it's actually Jupiter. Um, you can focus in and out and you'll see it get bigger and then become a fine pinpoint. When you do that, that's when your, your image is going to be sharp and in focus. Um, simply doing the image, if it's too bright, then I'll go ahead and I'll bring my exposure down first with the shutter speed to about 20 seconds. If it's still too bright, I'll bring down the ISO at that point in time to 1600 or 2000. And I just simply find that cameras handle noise so well nowadays that, you know, I just don't want that streaking. Um, there's a formula, the rule of 500s where your focal length over 500 gives you your shutter speed that you can do without streaking. I never worry about that because I'm always using either a 17 or a 20 millimeter lens. So I'm not having to worry about the, the streaking because 30 seconds is, is plenty of time not to get the streaking. Then every once in a while you get lucky and you get a, a meteor or a satellite in the image, not a plane because they always have the dotted lines. You can see the air glow on the horizon. 
which is simply the green cast. This is down in Apalach Cole. It's one of the boats that they eventually cleaned up off the shoreline. Shame on them, but I guess they needed to. Again, this is Balanced Rock. This was at one of the Out of Chicago events. I teach at several of those events each year. And this is the Donna K that I referred to down at Cape Sandblast. Just one of the most beautiful boats just to, that lined up perfectly with the fall time night sky. Just absolutely incredible. But, you know, people were vandalizing it. People were getting in and it became a really a bad hangout for some, some folks doing drugs in, the, in the, the cabin of the boat and everything. So they cut it up and removed it. Uh, Arches National Park, a juniper tree. This is Jekyll Island down at the uh, Georgia Nature Photographers uh, Annual Expo. Sometimes add people to your landscape images. Um, this is an image that everybody wants to get if they go, if they've ever seen it. This is photographing turret arch through North Window Arch. Uh, my teaching partner, Cecil Holmes, and I got there easily three or four hours before sunrise because we heard that this little balcony or this little ledge that we were on really filled up with people so we were the first ones there we were waiting we waited all night long just you know uh, it was it was a long time then about 15 to 20 minutes before the sun rose two to three hundred people showed up and they were standing in this arch and we were so depressed but then as soon as the sun came out and rose a little bit right when the lighting got perfect for us every one of them left well except for one and I asked that person to stand in the, in the arch for me and just simply raise her arms. Then I yelled over to her, talked to her, got her email address and sent her the images. But I think it's just, it gives it a sense of size and a sense of scale and becomes a very marketable image. Um, the Triangle X Ranch, where we do all of our workshops in Wyoming, uh, they hired me a couple of years ago to come out and do all their promotional photography. And this is one of the images that I did for them with some of the riders simply riding at sunrise in front of the mountains. And you see this, and how could you not want to go ride horses at this place? Uh, we do two workshops in May there that we actually do horseback riding. It's optional. But if you want to do horseback riding, we, you know, we allow you guys to have the afternoon off or the morning off or both and, and do some horseback riding. They also offer float trips. And I was in a boat chasing them down the, the Snake River um, with a guide. And we just got to this one particular area. And I really just loved the way that the guide standing by himself really made it stand out with the grand in front of him. So I thought it really was a pretty neat image. Turned out well. This is the lodge house at the, uh, um, at the Triangle X Ranch. Everybody's gone into breakfast that morning. So intentional camera movement. I've, I've always been a fan of the impressionist and, and impressionism. And I really love doing intentional camera movement when it's right to do it. So I prefer moving vertically, you know, up and down. Um, some people will do them horizontally. I'm not as big a fan with those. But when I get really strong vertical lines, I really love doing ICMs. Typically, I try to, I go ahead and I keep it on a tripod, but I just simply move it up and down very short strokes, maybe a quarter to a half inch. And I'm doing about a one second exposure. I'll just hold the, the shutter button down and I just move it up and down. Then hopefully out of, you know, five, 10 images, I'm going to get some good ones. Uh, these, these are some Aspens in the snow and Grand Teton. These are some birch trees in, in Acadia National Park. These are some uh, birch trees up in Alaska some lodgepole, not lodgepole pines, uh, longleaf pines down in Tate's Hell outside of Apalachicola, Florida. You can see the, the bases were burned. So I really love that contrast of the black bark that's, that's the burned areas to the, the lighter shade of bark. And this was some aspen trees from this last trip uh, in uh, Grand Teton National Park as well. So the goal is always to create pretty pictures. It's often the light that's there. I've, I, I really was sort of not depressed, but I, I wanted to stand up and raise my hand and disagree with some of my counterparts in, in instruction with the uh, out of Chicago event in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park that we did just a couple months ago. <coughs> Excuse me. 
um, because I heard several of them say, there's no such thing as bad light. And I just wanted to say, I've seen horrible light. I just don't photograph in it. Um, you know, and then I, I had a discussion with several and they said, well, you're just not using the right techniques during that light. And I said, it's, it's not what I consider good light. I mean, I, I was a painter and you use the right paints, you use the right hues, you use the right temperature of, 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 of paint to, to get your, your image across. So I do believe there's bad light. And I believe that early light and late light is the right light to be in or overcast light or stormy light, but just hot overcast midday light is, is not my idea of good light. So I do believe there is bad light. This is early morning light at just one of the local mountains, uh, Arabia mountain, uh, just east of Atlanta, about an hour, just at sunrise. This is Boulder beach in Acadia national park. And I love the way that the light just painted a thin line across the rocks. That to me was just a, a gem and it came all the way around, but just that little bit of light made up for the fact that there's no real color in the sky. Um, again, it's, it's the light, not the color in this situation. Uh, this is just an overcast day. When I photograph waterfalls, I love photographing in, in either rain or overcast light. And this was the, the best of it for me. Just a nice little rainy day uh, to get to this place. It's called Cloudland Canyon. You have to go up and down a total of about 4,000 steps to get in and out of this area. This is at Dead Horse Point State Park outside of Moab, Utah. And one of my teachers, like I mentioned earlier, was Art Wolf. And Art Wolf did a book years ago that was called Light on the Land. And through art and through that book, I really learned how just the minimalism of light on a landscape can be everything that you need. Just a little bit of shadow detail, but just that highlight is what finishes just almost taking a paintbrush with sunlight and just dabbing a couple little spots really can can make such a huge difference in the image this is on uh, diamond beach in iceland this is just a late evening light the sun was getting ready to set uh, this is just one of the big huge ice chunks this thing is the size of a van i don't remember if you guys uh i don't know if you heard the story a couple of years ago about a lady that sat on this ice chunk her kid was videoing her kid he's 34 or 35 years old and the ice chunk started to go back out to sea <coughs> excuse me and instead of going to rescue his mother he kept videoing it and just a random stranger ran over and and pulled her off and brought her in well this is the ice chunk that she was sitting on we were there the day before it happened and these ice chunks move around pretty regularly it happened to my wife uh -oh. she, sa <clears throat> she sat on one and started to sail <laughs> do you have insurance on her yes <laughs> I, if i was this lady i would have taken my that kid out of the will i mean plain and simple you know did you rescue your wife yeah that's not, uh, no, she, that's uh, she didn't go that far but i was able to run and pick up uh, and hold her she jumped off the ice did you get any good shots of it yes i do <laughs> that's a photographer <laughs> save the lady and get the picture there you go well, i've got good pictures of people being almost washed down there on diamond beach was i one of them no you weren't caught in it <laughs> i've i've gone down a couple times on diamond beach i'll just uh get so involved i mean these ice chunks can be the lightest ones are probably 20 30 pounds but most of them are somewhere in the range of two to 500 pounds and a big wave comes in a sneaker wave comes in and it'll knock you down I mean, there's no yeah. doubt about it. You've got to pay yeah. attention. So this is just some of the other ice chunks out there. These, each of these ice chunks are easily 200 pounds. And just when you see those waves come in, they can, they can really, they have some force and they can, they can knock you down or suck you under when you're, when the water's going back out. Each of these is about a one second exposure again. And I'm simply using a neutral density filter to slow it down to give me that look. What I love about Diamond Beach is it really gives you the opportunity to utilize leading lines that you normally wouldn't think of. 
those those waves as they go out give you that leading line effect um, and then just the distortion around the ice chunks themselves really just make for some beautiful patterns back on jekyll island the same little tree on driftwood beach this is an area that you really can't do this image anymore um, it's in Grand Teton National Park. It's on Pilgrim Creek Road. And since I did this image, the, the grizzly bears tend to congregate in this area. And for the safety of the people and the bears, they close the road off and you can't even walk back there. But I did this image maybe five, six years ago. And it was probably the first time in 20 years that the, the lupine was blooming to the extent that it was blooming. And this was uh, with one of the all-in-one lenses because I was just constantly moving left to right, back and forth, just trying to find the right composition. Uh, one of the ice caves, the first time we went to Iceland a couple of years back. Um, ice caves are absolutely phenomenal. This one, um, <clears throat> it was probably more memorable because uh, Icelandic people that, that were our guide on that trip had no sense of distance. He told us it was a three kilometer round trip. It ended up being three miles each way with two inch spikes going across the top of a glacier. And when I heard three kilometers round trip, I loaded up everything I owned into my camera bag and took it out there and I regretted it. Um, so I'm, I'm very specific now when I'm talking to a guide as to <clears throat> the exact distance of how far we're going to go. And Bill, the last one was what, a, maybe a mile each way. Yeah, it was really just beautiful. And I've got some images from inside of that cave as well. This is the uh, first cave we went to years ago. And this is the last cave. Um, it, it's really nice. If you ever go to Iceland, you know, there's nothing wrong with going on your own. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. But you'll find that a lot of times <clears throat> you need someone that's familiar with the area. You need a guide that's got the connections. Um, with this, when, when our guide Thor I know a Viking named Thor is our guide in Iceland. You know, how much better can he get than that? Um, when we were talking to him, he said it's the only ice cave that's open, so it tends to get crowded early. And I said, well, what do you mean by early? He said <coughs> that typically people leave to go out there at about 8 o'clock in the morning, so they get there at about 9. And he said, I'd like to leave at no, no later than 7. I said, let's leave at 6 and work our way out there then. So we got out there and this is as we were in the cave, the sun is coming up over the horizon and it's lighting up. I mean, the specular highlights turned gold. This is a nine frame HDR. But the reason I like having a guide is as we finished inside of this cave and moved to the little cave that's beside it, three people showed up and we would have had to work around those three people, but even better, as we finished in the other cave and started walking back, we easily passed 150 wow. to 200 people. So having just a complete to, parade, it, it really was. I mean, it was just like marching ants and it was just so nice to have the ability to not feel pressured to get the images that you want to get. Um, it's, it's worth every penny that we pay our guide over there to do these things with us. And these are just looking in different, different perspectives and different angles inside the cave itself. This is just further down after the, the light had peaked out. Mesa Arch. You know, one thing that I do in, on our workshops is a lot of people say they don't want to photograph the iconic, or a lot of photographers will say they don't photograph the iconic locations because it's been done before. You know, I always look at it from the perspective that not everyone in my workshop has done it before, and I'm going to take them to the iconic locations if they would like to get that image then we'll do perspectives and angles and areas that haven't been done but it's it's hard to go to arches national park or canyonlands national park and not shoot something like this if you have the opportunity um, you know of course there's 200 people that are around me as you're doing this at this time of the day you know because everybody shows up but to me it's well worth we got out again three four hours before sunrise shot the milky way above the arch um, it was worth it. And I think that everybody that went out there, you know, to, to the shoot enjoyed it and they got the images that they want to. I do the iconic shots and then we do the other shots. We do the creative stuff. 
Um, because our, our first goal that we want everyone to get in our workshops is to get some wall hangers. Uh, secondly, we want you to know how you got the wall hanger so we don't have to tell you how to do it the next time. You can get it on your own. Thirdly, we want you to have fun. So we try to make these things really fun for you. Uh, this is, uh, I live in an area of North Georgia where there's a hundred waterfalls easily. Uh, this is one of them, Minnehaha Falls, which shares a namesake uh, with a waterfall up in Minnesota as well. But this one is just a cascading uh, versus a, a large long fall like that one is. Uh, just a beautiful place. Again, a circular polarizer. I use a circular polarizer for any time that I'm photographing water or foliage. I'm simply trying to reduce the glare, increase the saturation. And the bonus is, is it, it increases my exposure uh, length as well. This is Cunningham Cabin across the road from the Triangle X Ranch where we stay. This was just a nice little crescent moon above the ranch. Beautiful light that's smoked from wildfires. So that's the, the disadvantage of going in the fall is the, the wildfires, but sometimes it does make for some pretty color in the skies. <coughs> so this is Mount Rundle. If you've ever been to Banff National Park and the Vermilion Lakes, as you get to the end of the Vermilion Lakes, you look over and you see Mount Rundle. And I went this particular morning to photograph reflections in the lake. And as I got out there, it had snowed the night before and wind started picking up just before the sunrise. And the light came up from behind the mountain and just beautiful, beautiful backlighting. And I very quickly threw on a 70 to 200 and started zooming in and taking pictures. I was by myself. I wasn't with a workshop group, but there were two other workshop groups there. And they see this 70 to 200 and they're thinking, you know, uh, wildlife lens. And a couple of people came over and they asked if I was photographing a moose. And I said, no, I was photographing the mountain and I showed them and they said, you know, they didn't even see it. They didn't even see that happening. And it was sort of a nice feeling just to, to know that you can be aware of the surroundings and what's going on to capture an image like that. It lasted no more than 10 seconds, you know, once I got the lens on. So a total of maybe 15, 20 seconds, but it was well worth it. This is Pato Lake, also referred to as Wolf Lake. You can see why. I get to every location that I go to, I get there early and I let the light develop um, because everything in an image changes with light. So as the light increased and started to hit the peaks of the mountains by Pato Lake, just got this beautiful light, this beautiful reflection. So it's, it's landscape is about the light. This is Moraine Lake, the rock pile, the famous rock pile at Moraine Lake in Banff National Park. This was first light hitting the Cathedral Mountains there. And then just a little bit later, again, I'm just sitting waiting for the light to develop. I was the only person on the rock pile. And it's one of the most famous places in all of Banff National Park. And I couldn't have figured out how such a beautiful location. This was in August, how it could be. I'm the only person that's there. And when I hiked up, it was dark. I went up this one trail. When I got back down, I looked and there was a sign saying, warning, Sal and two cubs in the area. So I'm lucky I didn't get eaten. I do carry bear spray, but that explained why I was the only person on the rock pile. This is uh, the basalt cliffs at, at Arenas Farja in, in Iceland, just outside of Vik. This is just using a telephoto lens to in, in a February morning or a March morning as that light hits the backlights, the basalt and bounces back into the other side over there. So again, I can't emphasize enough how important getting there early and, and waiting for things to develop can be. Um, I was doing a workshop. This was in 2016. We were in, in uh, Grand Teton. This was day one of the workshop. And I told the group, you know, the night before when we had our meeting that when we get to a location, I'm going to talk you through why I choose what f-stop for the depth of field. I'm going to talk you through the shutter speed, how I determine metering and everything that goes into it. We got to this location and I told them, I said, look, you guys, I want to explain why we're doing this, but I'm going to get you guys set up and I want you to just get ready to shoot. I'll call out the shutter speeds. I'll call out the apertures, everything, because this is going to be the most incredible sunrise I've ever seen in, in Grand Teton. So at this point, they really doubted me. Then 
we got a little bit of light hitting the high clouds and just lighting the ground. And I literally had to go over to a few of the people and beg them to push their shutter because they were missing it. And a few people, I pushed their shutter for them because I didn't want them to miss this. And a few of them were crying literally. And after they did this, they said, you know, I can't believe it. This is great. I said, don't go anywhere. It's not over. This is just the beginning. A couple minutes later, the light hit more and more of the clouds lit it up. This, this inversion in the, in the foreground, in the Valley started moving over a little bit. And I knew that within a couple minutes, we would have our second sunrise where the inverted clouds in the, in the, in the foreground actually lit up. So you got this beautiful, beautiful, great light on the clouds that were inverted. And again, having to push buttons for people. Then finally we got to the, the scene with everything cleared out and just the, the, the typical Schwabacher's landing from the parking area. Um, you know, the bad news was, is after all this, I mean, I had people crying. I witnessed the most incredible sunrise I'd ever seen in the Tetons. I had to break the news to them that this was session one of day one. It's going to be all downhill from this point that, that we're not going to match what we saw that morning. We came close a couple of times, but it was, it was the most incredible morning I've ever had in the Tetons. This was in Apalachicola, Florida. Um, I use a lot of apps when I'm doing my landscape photography. I use photo pills. I use several different weather apps. Uh, Ventu Sky is one. Clear Outside is another. And we were staying at a house in on St. George Island, and it was pouring down rain. <clears throat> but every one of the apps, the indication was right at sunrise, there was going to be a break in the clouds, and it was going to be epic. So... I didn't want to get up. I wasn't going to get up, but I did because I said, you know, I'm going to regret it. If something happens, I got down to Scipio Creek, the, the, the landing down there. And this is what materialized before me, just like the apps had said. And it was just one of those reminders. You do not get this image if you stay in bed. So trust it, always get out. Some days you don't get anything. Some days you do. This is a seven frame panoramic image of the, of the bay itself or of the, the uh, marina itself. <clears throat> this is in an area called Shore Acres uh, outside of Coos Bay, Oregon. And these waves, if you look at them, those waves are 300 feet tall. If you look over here, you see some people standing there. And these are when some big waves form out in the Pacific and they hit these rocks in the foreground and then just spray. And I, I was just mesmerized. This is like one four thousandth of a second. I was mesmerized at the power and the force that these waves had. Sorry about that. Drink a little water. Uh, Snake River Overlook, the, the famous spot where Ansel Adams had done his image years ago. This is a, a winter sunrise. And Ansel, when he did is he had this nice little S curve right here. Um, the trees have grown up, so you don't get that look anymore but it's still just an incredible place to photograph. One of my favorite locations. The ranch we stay at is five minutes or less away from here. Uh, this is one of the images I did for the Triangle X Ranch or when I was out there photographing. Uh, we had a horse that got loose. We found the horse while they were saddling it up. I was out in the field just doing a couple images of the horses with the, the mountains in the background. Um, They've, they hired me this year to do a calendar for them. And these are some of the images, actually. This image is in that calendar, as well as uh, some of the ones you saw earlier. Double rainbow over Balanced Rock, Arches National Park. Again, just simply looking at these, these different apps and seeing you know when a storm is going to go through, what direction the storm is going. Is there a distinct cloud line? If there's a cloud line, chances of getting a rainbow are going to be incredible. The rainbow is going to be at 70 degrees to either side. So, you know, it just works out perfect. This is a handheld panoramic that I did uh, last year in, in the Tetons at Snake River Overlook. I just panned over with my camera. I probably did, oh, 11 to 15 frames just swiveling at the hips. This is a little place called Ossabaugh Island. It's one of the barrier islands in the Georgia coast. There's no inhabitants that live there anymore. There are some people that occupy the island. There's about, well, two full-timers that live there that work for the Department of Natural Resources. And uh, there's some people that the Ossabaugh Foundation that they do some uh, events there. We're actually doing 
two photo workshops back to back in Osceola Island in February. Just a beautiful place. Uh, this was this past trip to Iceland. Uh, as our guide put it, this was simplistic shit or minimalist shit, excuse me. And pardon the French, that's, it's Icelandic for minimalist composition, apparently. Um, but we were just simply slowing down the exposure just a little bit to get these sea stacks behind it with the waves crashing in the foreground. Gibbs Garden. I love doing sun stars. To get a sun star, you have to have a single point source of light. So it can be anything diffracted around a branch. It can be a single point source of light, a star, a street light, anything. And then you need, you know, a higher aperture, F11, F16, F22. In this case, it's F16 um, or F22. I don't remember which one exactly. Um, <clears throat> but then what determines the number of, of spires in your sun star are the number of aperture blades in the lens. So if you've got a, a lens that has eight aperture blades, you're going to have eight spires. If you've got one that's got nine, you're going to have 18. It always doubles it. But with an even number, when it doubles it, they fall on top of each other. So you don't notice that they're doubled. With odd numbers, they fall in between each other. So you always get more spires. So all the lenses I use typically have nine shutter blades. This is just one of the fall scenes from Gibbs Garden. These are those northern lights that we had this past trip to, to Iceland that, that Bill and uh, Mark were on with us. Um, unbelievable full moon we didn't know what to expect but the light show was absolutely incredible you could see them dancing with the naked eye which just i haven't seen prior to this event but just absolutely beautiful um they lasted for an hour then we got back to the hotel and they were still going um, but i think we were all beat at that point in time these are I from my cell last... phone from the hotel cell phone oh, video yeah. It was amazing. That's, I got a new cell phone after that trip because everybody was getting these great videos and I didn't get anything on mine. So I, I, I traded in my phone and got a new one, upgraded. So this is from our last trip to Grand Teton. We just got back last week um, at the beginning of the week. This is one of my favorite overlooks called the Blacktail Ponds Overlook. Just a beautiful foreground. You, you know, when the mountains aren't in the clear, this is a great location to go to because there are other points of interest in the frame as well. Uh, this is an area that's called Spencer's Mountain. It's where the movie Spencer's Mountain was actually filmed. Um, that's Medlock, uh, Medlock Pond in the foreground. Yeah, I think um, for some reason that may not be the right name of it. Um, but this is just an area that's part of the Triangle X lease. So we, you know, have the combination and the key to the gate so we can drive up there and we did sunrise from it. Just an absolutely beautiful location. But if you watch the movie uh, Spencer's Mountain, you'll see the ranch in that and you'll see this location on numerous occasions there. And this was uh, one morning down at Schwabacher's Landing. A fog started to move in. I thought we were going to get some good early light, but the fog thickened up a little bit. Uh, we had some snow and that's what caused the fog. Um, one day it would be 70, the next morning we had snow on the ground, but I really liked how when the fog moved in at the peak of it, and you could still see the majority of the mountains, it gave it a nice, you know, ethereal look to it with the reflection in it as well. So I photographed the same locations over and over and over in different light, because they're always going to be different. And to me, it's just the thrill is there each time that I do that. And with that image, thank you guys very much. This is all of my contact information. Um, I do a daily post on Facebook and a blog. Um, I put it on uh, Instagram as well. Um, I have some videos on YouTube. I haven't done them in a little bit. I need to do some. I probably will from Alaska. But um, most of my, my posts are intended to be educational. Um, sometimes they're humorous and sometimes they're both. Sometimes I miss the point altogether. Um, but I give you my contact information. Also, if you're getting ready to go someplace and you're interested, if I've been there, I will share any information as to where I shoot, you know, some shooting locations, recommended settings, everything, you know, to me, it's all part of being uh, a good nature photographer is sharing that information with other people. Um, I think it's important to do that. Um, if it's somewhere where it could be a hazard that, that, people don't need to go to, I won't post the image. 
because you know if if i post the image i expect people to go there if it's some place that it, it could harm the environment i won't even post the image i'll submit it to you know people that need that image for whatever they're teaching or whatever the case may be but this is recorded so you guys will be able to get that so i'm going to stop sharing my screen and then i get to see all of you so any questions for me david do you have any slots open in the january workshop in the tetons i do not um what we're doing this this you're one of the lucky people um you and evelyn got the got the spots um what we started doing is is we decided to change the the format of our workshops where we're limiting it to a smaller number of people and we're providing all the ground transportation so we'll pick you up um you know, we'll pick you up at the airport. We bring you out to the lodge and we carry you around everywhere um, and then take you back to the airport when you're ready to leave. So we just decided that we wanted the experience to be a little bit more. So we decided on, on smaller groups. So I did see one on chat just popped up about the dreaded question as to would I please ask Tamron to start making Z lenses? Um, and I'll answer it this way. Tamron would love to sell Z lenses and RF mount lenses. Um, they can't do that yet from my understanding because Nikon and Canon have to release that, that licensing to do that. And Nikon and Canon, for those of you that, that are familiar with the mirrorless market, um, Nikon and Canon decided that it wasn't going to be a thing. So they didn't get into it right away. They got behind the eight ball. They waited a couple of years before they got into it. So they had to spend a lot of money to make up for the research and development that they did with their cameras. So one way to make up for that is to only sell their lenses. And I, my opinion is, is that's what they're doing at this point. But trust me, if can, if, if Tamron had the ability and had the the permission to do it, they would be doing that right now. Um, Nikon owns a small part of Tamron. And my guess is, is you could take several of the Nikon lenses and put them beside a Tamron lens and notice they are very, very, very similar. Um, take that as to how you want it. Um, Sony is also a part owner in Tamron and they've worked very closely with Tamron in the development of the technology and lenses for the Sony mount. They're doing Fuji lenses as well now. Um, they just released the um, uh, the 17 to 70 uh, f 2.8 today. They announced the, the release of that lens. But I, I would imagine, and I don't know, they don't tell me any secrets. Um, and if they did, I wouldn't, I couldn't tell you anyway. But my guess is, is that within the next year, you'll start to see some Z mount lenses and some R mount lenses. Um, I don't know that for a fact. I'm just guessing. But, you know, at that point in time, I think that Nikon and Canon are going to find that people are going to shy away from their stuff because there are no third-party lens choices at this point, not anything good out there. So I think that, that <clears throat> they're going to have to open that market up to Tamron and Sigma. Sigma makes some beautiful lenses. Um, you know, so I know that they're ready to get into the market as well. Yeah, Any but it other... took them, it took them almost a year, you know, it took them a couple of years to get a Sony lens because Sony wouldn't release their proprietary stuff. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, and what Tamron did too, part of it was Tamron's aspect of the whole mirrorless market. Um, they decided they weren't going to simply put um, a different mount on the back of a lens, which Sigma did at first and kudos to Sigma because they took advantage of the market and they did some good stuff with it. But Tamron said people are going to mirrorless because they want smaller and lighter cameras. And if you're simply taking and putting an extension on the back of an existing lens, you may have a lighter body, but you don't have the lighter lens. And that was Olympus's advantage is the smaller body, the smaller lenses. So Tamron said that in order for them to get into the market, they were going to completely redesign their entire lens line. And that's what they've done. Um, you know, they've, they've done a really good job, like with the 70 to 180 versus 70 to 200 by making it a 70 to 180, they reduced the weight by 25% and the overall length by 20%, you know, just by taking 20 millimeters off 20 millimeters is 
one giant step forward is all you got to do to make up that that distance really so you know i'm 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 very impressed and they don't pay me to say this stuff i mean i could leave at any time <laughs> but i just i love their lenses i've been shooting their lenses since the 70s and i i truly believe that when you look at their lenses they're putting out in the sony mount and now the fuji mount there's they're top top notch they're top tier lenses and when they start doing the canon and, and nikon um it's going to be the same thing. You're going to see a fairly quick introduction of some of these lenses, the 150 to 5, uh, 1728, 28, the 2875, 28, and, and the uh, 35, 150, hopefully will be one that they, they also do. So I think it's coming. Um, mirrorless is the mark is, is the future market that there are no manufacturers now that are making digital SLR bodies or digital SLR lenses. I mean, they're done. So if you haven't gone to mirrorless, I would seriously start taking a look into doing that because, um, you know, right now your, your lenses have some resale value, um, but, you know, they may not have that resale value in, in a year or two years. So that was my little rant on mirrorless. <laughs> very, very different from my rant on digital photography in 1999, obviously. It's not going to amount to anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just a passing fancy. Yeah. Where's Alan? He wants to shoot film. You know, I used to love film, but you just, you, I would not go back for anything. I just wouldn't do it. I mean, it's just the dynamic range within, and I still shoot manual mode where I'm really picky, you know, on my exposure, but just the dynamic range I have within digital and, and the capabilities I have to, with with film you finish the image when you release the shutter with digital you finish your vision when you hit save for the final time and to me that's a big big difference because from when i release the shutter to when i finish it on the computer there's a lot of stuff that happens in between well for me not a lot maybe three or four steps but it's still a part of the vision that i had when i released the shutter that i couldn't get at that point in time so, you know, I just think it's necessary. A question so, on one of your images, David. Yes. Uh, the Miller cabin shot. Okay. I stumbled across that by accident uh, one time and then went back to shoot it. And it was uh, in June. So there was leaves and wind that I couldn't make a good image out of that because I couldn't get the exposures that I wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what focal length did you shoot that at? That was probably with the uh, 2875. Um, it may have been, I'd have to look at it to be sure. Um, it could have been the 150 to 500, but I'm guessing it was either the 2875 or 70 to 180. Um, that was in the winter time. The light tends to be a little more favorable. So you guys will get a chance this, this January, depending upon the snowfall that's there. Um, but what you have to do is you have to park and walk up to get to it because, um, you can't just stop on the road unless you jump out real quick and do the image. Um, there's no parking that's, that's allowed there. Um, yeah, but, I, I had Evelyn drop me at where I wanted to shoot from and she drove on to the house to their yeah. parking lot. And it's not that far, maybe a quarter of a mile, but I, I want to say, I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it was probably the 28 to 75. Okay. On that particular image at 75. Yeah. And I, I had the 120 to 300 on and tried to compress it mm -hmm. to bring the mountains right up on top of the cabin. Yeah. That, and that's a, that's a tough shot because the angle that that house is at in order to get that middle ground, that middle Hill and still get a lot of the mountain, you've got to be back a little bit. Whereas if you try to compress that house up against the mountain, you lose some of that foreground where you lose some of that middle ground, excuse me. So it's, it's like a, a very small window on that road that you can get that shot. Yeah. Can the people that are listening to us talk like we've been here before you might, can you get to that image? Yeah. Let's see. Let me share my screen again. Let me go to here first. Oops, now I need to go back over to here. Uh, let's see. Let me share my screen. Do, 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 do. Let 
that image there yes yeah yep so yeah with this you can see that if you get too close you start to lose you would lose some of the house in the foreground here um, but then you would lose this middle ground and it would actually cut into this mountain up here because the distance between this butte and that mountain is probably uh, i'm going to go out on a limb and say seven eight miles maybe 10 miles mm. so there's there's enough that there's a lot of distance there. yeah there is there is that got it there we go so you know the tetons are one of my favorite locations for you know there's there's not a prettier place than the tetons for landscape um we got really really lucky this past trip that we were on that um we were there for 10 days well 11 days and out of those 11 days nine and a half of them were absolutely incredible weather um some of the best sunrise opportunities we've seen uh, breaks my heart to see what's happening in yellowstone right now um you know very very sad to see some of that mm -hmm. um but you know we just we've always just stuck to the tetons because of the triangle x ranch and just sort of not done yellowstone before any other questions that should i look in the chat or did someone look down there already i had a question um okay. my name is Lainey and i was um one of my favorite things to shoot is in the fog and so i was kind of curious like what tips do you have for kind of that foggy weather where you start to lose the detail in the landscape um, to either like lean into it or enhance the details so that you get that stunning picture? So what I like to do in the fog, and this is, this is one of those finishing techniques as well. Um, when I'm shooting in the fog, um, I, I, I shoot in manual mode. I will make sure that my meter though is at about plus one. So I'm, I'm brightening because the, the, the camera meter wants to make it darker than it should be. So I lighten it a little bit, but I, I pay attention to that histogram to make sure that it's not touching the right-hand side of the, the histogram itself. I don't want to blow out the details. I want to get, you know, strong, strong detail, but still maintain everything. Then one of the only things I'll do in post-processing with it is I tend to bring my black slider over to the left a little bit. And then I take my dehaze slider and take it to the right. Um, the dehaze slider is a, is a micro contrast adjustment. So it will give you some really nice detail in trees and stuff that are in the fog. Um, so, you know, and you, it's, a, it's a fine line. You play with it. You don't want to overdo it because it takes away some of the foggy effect. But at the same time, you want to get just enough of that detail. And typically with the black slider and the, and the dehaze, we'll do that for you. Does that help? Yeah, that helps them. Thank you. Let's see. I'm just sort of peeking over here at some of the questions. Um, uh, da, 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 da. White Santa's National Park. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. There's that infamous Z question. Um, ba, ba, ba. All right, I think that's the questions. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Say hi to Lisa to me. I will. I will. Yeah, um, they are. I saw they were in Wolverine Creek um, yesterday or today. Alex McClure's up there with her right now. So I think yesterday they were on Wolverine Creek. Um, then they should be getting back to the lodge on probably Sunday is when they finish. Then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is the bear mountain lodge that they'll take yeah. them out to. And then she'll pick me up Thursday at the airport in that glorious 60 degree weather. <laughs> I just, Oh my gosh, heat. I just don't get along with heat at all. You know, I do all my shooting. I shoot every day. Um, every morning I get up and I go to my back porch and I photograph, um, a 60 Fahrenheit. Someone asked if it was Fahrenheit or Celsius. Um, but I photograph every morning. I've got a, my backyard is actually a wildlife sanctuary. Um, and I built a bird studio. So I photograph birds from my back porch with my bowl of raisin bran and my cup of coffee. Um, but I can tell you, even this morning by 
eight thirty, nine o'clock. It was just miserably hot. So, <coughs> excuse me. In 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 return, I get this summer cold. So like I said, you know, I, I I I think I've had COVID three times. So when I first started coughing, I was like, oh no, not a fourth. So I've tested a couple of times and I've been negative every time. So I'm, I'm good. So, cause COVID has just been, I don't know about you guys, but I'm glad that we're at that point where we're getting out and doing stuff and seeing people's faces. And I really miss seeing people smile for two mm-hmm. years. Yep. So. Anything else? I can break no one else has a question, David. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. This has been informative. Good, good. And I learn more about how great you are every time I'm around you. <laughs> I owe you a steak dinner at the ranch. <laughs> right. Real. And triangle X. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> All the food is at the is cooked at the ranch and it is outstanding food. Yeah, the the this pastime when we got there our first meal that we had, we had a choice between a 24 ounce prime cut porterhouse steak or fresh Maine lobster tail flown in that morning. So, oh my gosh. <laughs> when and it's all Evelyn, included in the price of the workshops. And when so. Evelyn and I did the pack trip, we spent the night upstairs in the main house mm-hmm. and ate, ate with the uh, Wranglers in the small dining room it's the first time i've seen the big dining room filled up with people the only time it's it's amazing i mean we were there they were just getting we do it the first 10 days that they're open our spring workshops now and you sort of see it build the crowd build by the time we leave um that's their their part of their peak season is when it begins so it fills up really big so there's no Very better good. way to see the Tetons. No, there's not. I mean, you wake up, step out your cabin door, take a couple steps, and there it is. So try it, try it stepping out of your tent. <laughs> oh, I bet. I bet it's even better. <laughs> My next door neighbors did the pack trip and absolutely rant and rave over it. Um, mm-hmm. it's wonderful. Yeah, it's just it's so different. I mean, and they don't have bad food on the pack trips either. No, they don't. It's it's full complete meals and they do a good job of fixing them they do they do so the kids there that they hire they have to spend a certain amount of, with with tom and larry in the in the main kitchen so they cook to their standards versus you know uh, just whatever they would do so they do a good job so yeah this trip in january got a little surprise for you guys because we've got two guest instructors coming out so we got four of six participants and four instructors Uh, we've got a landscape photographer out of georgia named travis rhodes that'll be with us out there and then we've got another tamron uh ambassador that uh, specializes in location portraiture marcy reef and she will be with us in in the tetons as well so you guys get sort of a bonus because we'll get the wranglers to do some portrait sessions with us as well and we'll let Marcy lead some of that. So, oh, that that will Very be cool. outstanding. Yeah, we try to make these things fun. You know that. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I think you had a little bit of Tamron support when I was there. Yep. Yeah, they. Uh, if you know Tamron, will usually send some folks out, but they definitely send the lenses out. They'll yeah. send a couple trunks of lenses, and that way, if you want to try something, they've got them there for you to use. So makes it fun and easy Mm -hmm. all right you guys stay cool don't don't cook out in the heat (coughs) and hopefully we'll see everyone pretty soon looking forward to see you next year yes as soon as the year rolls around absolutely we're getting there january (laughs) 1st i think is when we get in okay cool all right good night y'all thanks david bye-bye